Welcome to King County Connects, where we connect you with some of the top issues in King County and the region. I'm Enrique Cerna. What is the best way to help kids here in King County reach their full potential? The council is working on a youth action plan to set priorities for programs that will help young people. Joining me now is King County Council Member Rod Dembowski, who sponsored the legislation, and Terry Potmeyer, who represents the group Friends of Youth. Welcome, good to have you here. Well, let's talk about this legislation, um, why you sponsored it, and give me the back story on this. Well, thank you, Enrique, for covering the issue and one of the county council's top priorities. Um, is really investing in and making sure we're doing everything we can uh, for our community's youth. So a year ago, the county council, with near unanimous uh, sponsorship of the legislation, passed an ordinance uh, calling for development of a youth action plan. And uh, while we have tremendous amount of uh, knowledge and experience, we knew that we really needed to go to the experts to make sure we came back with the very best plan. And so we appointed a task force of 25 leading children and youth advocates from all over King County to work for a year to come up with a plan and, and that's what they've done. Well, Terry, uh, you were part of that task force. First, tell me about Friends of Youth. Friends of Youth is a human service organization on the east side of King County that started uh, 65 years ago doing child welfare work, primarily foster care, has grown in response to the needs of the community's children, is a youth and family service provider along with a host of other YFS agencies in King County and recently in the 80s started uh, supporting homeless youth on the east side. What do you see as the major problem for youth today in King County? Is it a growing number of homeless youth or is it more in the foster care area? What? I think probably the most pressing need for youth in King County is um, prevention work, working with children when they are first born into their families, families that want the very best for them, but need the support of an entire caring community to really achieve their potential. So being a part of this effort to kind of craft the legislation and the direction and all of this, what did you want most out of it? I am so excited that we're going to have a coordinated response throughout the county. We cannot help youth just one child at a time. We really have to have a coordinated strategy, strategy throughout the region. It's really exciting that um, County Council has really shown a light on this issue and that we're going to have a coordinated response. What is that? What does that mean, a coordinated response? I mean, what's the focus about all of Well, Enrique, uh, what Terry's getting at is uh, there are a number of organizations, both public sector, nonprofit sector, educational districts, school districts that are really uh, driven by their mission to support our young people. Um, too often they work in silos and one of the major recommendations coming out of the task force and in the report is to break down the silos and make sure that we are working together with a common focus and attention to uh, outcomes for our children. And, for example, so the county runs a health department and we deliver vital services in the public health arena. We're not in the education business, but we make sure that kids are healthy and show up and be ready to learn. So in that sense, there's coordination and one of the recommendations is to make sure we're coordinating more. Just to give you an example. The history on this, as far as uh, why this became so important, I, I believe uh, Dow Constantine, the county executive, made it a priority as well. Where did you come in on that? Sure. So the council initiated the uh, legislation calling for development of a youth action plan, and that work has, has been ongoing. In the county executive's budget speech, uh, the, the executive uh, really came in and supported and, and emphasized the need for additional work in this area. One of the recommendations in the report is, <clears throat> first of all, to spend the money that we have already more wisely, make sure we're getting the best bang for our buck. But there is no doubt uh, that we have not invested and are not investing enough in making sure we have the best outcomes we can for children and young people in the county. <clears throat> and the county executive has recommended, and will be recommending, I think, in his State of the County speech, um, that we make a significant additional investment of new resources in young people in the county through his Best Starts for Kids levy proposal. Uh, that really is the next step. It builds on the foundation laid in this document for how to, current, how to spend current resources as best as possible and then where new resources should go. It's one of the things Terry was talking about with respect to making sure we invest upstream. Another major recommendation in the report is to go on a preventative basis, Enrique, and invest dollars upstream because we know one of the sad things that you see here at the county is when we don't make those investments in health and in housing and in, in child care, good quality child care, 
too often uh, that increases the chance of, of touching our justice system. And once a young person gets into our juvenile justice system, as progressive as we are here in King County, mm -hmm. the outcomes are um, statistically very bad. And it's very, very expensive. Well, and I know too that you know there has been much discussion and controversy within the county about you know the building a new juvenile <coughs> justice center. Yes. And where people are very concerned about the fact that okay maybe you're putting too much money into the bricks and mortar and not enough into the services that could actually help those kids. Is that a concern for you? It's not a concern for me because it is the. Uh, the bricks and the mortar that bring the families together when a child does have an, an impact in the juvenile justice system. And I think having um, an integrated, wonderful facility for people and families to come to really address um, behaviors that are challenging for a young person is really, really important. The current um, building uh, is currently constructed and used is just not a good place for kids and families. So I'm actually very excited to see this, this new investment in bricks and mortar, which I think will help lives. So when we talk about youth today, we're talking from the point that they're, they're born to what age? Is that you're putting the focus here? 24. Mm -hmm. And I think we've learned a lot um, as the years have gone on, uh, particularly with brain research, about um, how long it takes a young person to fully develop into an adult. And it really does happen really um, even before birth, um, stretching until the age of 24. I have young... Um, I have young people in my family, and I can say from personal experience what many of us recognize, that indeed it is about 24 yeah. that you can put it all together and really launch and be fully independent. As a father of a 26-year-old, I can verify that. <laughs> um, you know, I think that that's, that's very true. We know that those early years are so much, uh, there's, there's really important there for uh, the development, but it, it never really stops until they reach into those early 20s, mm -hmm. and so that's, that's I think, very critical. And we're probably very fortunate, too, that we have a lot of work that's being done here on the issue of, uh, you know, brain development, young mm -hmm. child development as well. Um, there, there are a number of recommendations here, yes. so, so take me through some of that. Well, um, one that is probably is worth highlighting right now, given this exchange is, uh, and maybe one of the most compelling recommendations in the report is ending the school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the dialogue that we've been having in the community, sometimes heated or passionate. And it, you know, we should have a passionate dialogue about these issues. Um, but the recommendations from the task force in the Youth Action Plan to take steps, and it enumerates a number of steps, but the main recommendation on that issue is to end that school to prison pipeline. Because as I said, once the young person has contact with the juvenile justice system, as good as we are, and as better as we're going to be, um, it's very costly. And the, the, the adverse experiences and the impacts on that young person are really hard to overcome. Um, and so we hope, with the recommendation of the report, Enrique, to try and prevent a young person from coming down to the juvenile justice center, right? right? We want to divert before there's a referral. Uh, I'm working with Prosecutor Satterberg, the public defenders, our human services organizations, and community partners, we're taking a number of steps to make sure that uh, we keep folks from coming into the, into the juvenile justice system. We've got a good track record here in King County. Ten years ago, we had, on average, 200 kids a night incarcerated. We're down to something closer to 50 now. We're taking steps right now to even further reduce that number. One of the persistent problems that we're having, as much progress as we've made, is with respect to uh, the disparity across race. And while we're reducing the overall numbers, too many kids of color, too many kids of color still make up a proportion, a large proportion of the folks that are coming into contact with the juvenile justice system. And that's another recommendation coming out of the Youth Action uh, Plan is to really drill down and take steps to end the disparity um, in the juvenile justice system, but also in um, the prevention work. And by making more investments and taking more action upstream, uh, we can reduce those downstream disparities as well. How do you see that work actually, or, or progress being made in that area? That, that to me seems to be one of the really big challenges. Um, as someone who's spent time uh, covering the juvenile justice system, and actually uh, I've spent some time recently doing some research for some uh, stories that I'm working on, and the majority of the kids there are young kids of color. So what do you see as the way of trying to change that? I think that a lot of it is connected too with um, the economic gap in, in our communities, um, the support for families. Um, we, 
one of the one of the advantages of this plan or one of the strengths is that it really does prioritize the youth most in need of support on their journey to to reach their full potential and um, we need to invest in communities and families that need more support in learning the parenting journey and supporting their children as they grow to young adults um, those investments are really key and really critical and I think that we have very wide disparities across our county and um, again I think disproportionately impacting communities of color um, and uh, addressing that and being really intentional and taking that on that problem and being brave enough to say that we're going to invest more in certain communities. This isn't a peanut butter approach. This is really making sure we're addressing the most significant needs for the youth in the community. I think the economic issue is a big one because here we live in a county that's uh, very prosperous, particularly if you look for Seattle that's booming right now, but yet uh, we also know that there is this huge disparity in income and issues of you know what people make and what people don't make. <coughs> and, and I'm sure that that's kind of a, an impact on the young people that are being affected here. It is, Enrique. Um, you know, the, we are seeing here in King County, the 13th largest county in the country, um, something that's been kind of a national trend, and that is the suburbanization of poverty. Um, I represent a district uh, that's uh, two-thirds suburban, one-third city of Seattle. I grew up in Renton. Uh, growing up there, it was a suburban, middle-class mm -hmm. community for the most part. Most of my friends, folks, worked at Boeing, building the 737 and other uh, planes. It's the, some, Many of our suburban communities are very different today. Right. and. Um, Not so the, much as to what you've experienced. It's very different. It's very, very, very different. Yeah. And the economic yeah. ability to combat those issues, the political and governance issues, um, there's some catch-up going on there. Um, mm -hmm. It's no longer to the extent it ever was, but and it was really kind of a Seattle-based issue. The need is really countywide now to make sure that we are reaching out and making these investments early on in kids. So uh, as part of this, I mean, we know that the focus is on youth here, but what about the parenting part of it, as you talked before? Mm -hmm. How does that work into what's being planned here? I think um, much of the conversation during the year that we spent working on the plan was just that issue, um, really supporting parents because parents, children don't grow up in King County, they grew up in families in King County. Um, paying attention to providing family support, family resources, parenting support, um, really helping particularly young parents because you can actually um, envision that we're talking about young people 19, 20, 21, who are also parenting. So they themselves are youth, and they're starting the next generation. We were really intentional in talking about those populations and what kinds of things we needed to strategize um, so that those young people can raise healthy kids. One issue that, uh, it's actually a couple of issues that uh, during the time that I have been visiting in uh, juvenile justice uh, court is the, the problem that many of these kids have from a mental illness standpoint as well as substance abuse. Or is that a part of the, the effort here? Um, you know, we did a, a great job, I think, on doing community outreach. Um, and one of the things the young people themselves told us was just that, that depression and substance abuse were issues that they particularly were concerned about. Um, King County does support the Youth and Family Service Network, um, which may, ensures that there are mental health and substance abuse providers that are community-based throughout King County. There's definitely a need to increase those services and to make them accessible to young people. We talked about partnerships with schools so that young people could have that opportunity to get the support they needed during the school day or in the least and lowest barrier um, uh, place, which is often schools. So while we talk about this plan being a King County plan, um, one of the strength is that King County can bring those people, those parties together and be a convener so that we can as an entire community strengthen um, the supports for kids. And Enrique, on, on the substance abuse issue and mental health issue, I think it's worth noting, we talked a little bit before about geography. Um, those are problems that are present in every part of King County, from the poorest communities to the wealthiest communities. Uh, kids have challenges with mental health and with substance abuse and uh, it's one of the great things about this plan and the Best Starts for Kids uh, proposal coming forward is uh, that we go where and we focus on where the need is and um, really have targeted solutions to address those challenges. Did you get input from the courts from yes. judges who I, I, I know. Judge St. Clair was on our, one of our uh, right. uh, committee members. He's the chief juvenile judge. Uh, Bobby Bridge, former state Supreme Court justice. and uh, Used the, to be presiding judge. In uh, juvenile presiding court, juvenile has led a lot of our reform efforts. She served on the Youth Action Plan Task Force. What did they tell you? What, what was their big concern about what they wanted to focus on? 
Well, they were very interested in upstream investments, right? Diversion before contact with the justice system. Mental health was a was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Substance abuse a big deal. You see those patterns of um, uh, that result in in the adverse uh, consequences. Some uh, additional reform probably that would need to occur in Olympia. Um, again, work on the disparity across uh, racial and ethnic lines. Um, and, you know, providing good, healthy opportunities for kids to uh, succeed, to pursue their full potential, whether that be in employment, in training, in education, um, giving those pathways in partnership with, you know, some of our community organizations, I think were some of the emphasis mm -hmm. that I heard from our partners, yeah. our panel members. You also have listed here a Youth Bill of Rights. What does that mean? I'd love to respond to that. The Youth Bill of Rights was actually in the in the ordinance. So the the com task force was responding to um, creating perhaps a Youth Bill of Rights. The interesting thing about this process is that when we talked about that with the young people, they said, not yet. We're not ready to go to a Youth Bill of Rights. We really want first to ensure that our voice is being heard and considered in the conversations. That to us is much more important than enacting a Youth Bill of Rights. And so with um, taking that input very seriously, the task force is actually not recommending drafting a Youth Bill of Rights at this time, but instead first including youth voice um, in, in a genuine way um, as we enact the plan and then deciding later with their input whether that's the right next step. Was there a youth voice in this task force? We had a great debate about the best way to incorporate young people into it and uh, what we decided to do was engage in uh, community conversations. We had five of those throughout the county in Kirkland and Shoreline, South Seattle, Kent and Snoqualmie. Uh, and then, Enrique, we conducted what I believe is the largest survey of young people uh, to have been conducted in county, at least recent memory, and over a thousand young people responded uh, to a survey asking about their needs. The community conversations were incredibly powerful meetings. I went to all of them. Uh, they were rich with dialogue. We really listened. Young people showed up in droves uh, and gave us their input. And that input is reflected to a very large degree uh, in the plan. Their voice was uh, given significant weight and then in the recommendations some of the most powerful recommendations are to build structures um, in our policies and programs as we go forward that include those with to whom we're providing services to talk to the client and engage them and make sure that we're meeting their needs and that includes young people. So what did the youth say? What was the thing that they were most concerned about? Well, when we were talking about barriers to success, um, the youth uh, named two. One was depression, which we've talked a little bit about, and the other was um, feeling safe in school. Mm -hmm. And that was a surprise to the members of the task force, but it was definitely something that we heard from the youth who participated. And so it's something that we really spent a lot of time talking about in the task force. It's kind of sad that we have come yeah. to that point where kids have to worry mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but I can see that that is a growing concern. And, and you have so many incidents of, Around the, around the country. So where is the focus on that, the safety for the youth in school? It's one of our recommendations. Um, again, this is not necessarily a King County-centric plan in terms of us as a government, mm -hmm. um, but that is work that will go on uh, with our schools, our school district partners. We had a representative on the task force from the Educational Service District, Puget Sound Educational Service District, so there's an opportunity to engage on a go-forward basis um, uh, with those kind of organizations. So the Youth Bill of Rights, you say it's not in the works right now, but will it be at some time the line here? I'd say it's up to the young people. I right? think it is indeed <laughs> up to the young people, whether that's something that they would think would be a positive step forward or whether just including their voice um, might suffice and be the right way to go. Is there anything on here that you wanted to be a part of this that wasn't included? Uh, no. I mean, I, I've uh, participated, I think, in every uh, task force meeting. I was the council's designee to the task force meeting. And what I said, Enrique, was um, I'm not an expert. That's why we have the experts here. I want to be an advocate uh, and help me be an advocate. But I, I did not bring to the table particular expertise on these issues. But the other 24 members certainly did. Um, and it is a very, very powerful document. You read it, and, and it makes sense. And so. Um, I would defer to somebody like Terry who spent a career, a lifetime, working with and on behalf of young people uh, before I presume to say something should be in the plan that, that's not. Terry? I don't think there's anything that I would um, highlight as missing, but to me the power of this plan is that it will evolve and grow over time. Mm -hmm. 
So it was not intended to be a laundry list of every possible thing that we could do to make to make um, the journey to adulthood work for every child, but instead we've created a, a framework, and more important than that, we're paying attention to this issue and we're prioritizing it through the county. Um, the power of that, to me, is the importance of this document and uh, sustaining that by having a single point of accountability in the county, um, convening the people who do care about kids, ensuring the task force even meets again in a year to see how we're mm -hmm. doing, being transparent, um, including youth voice. I think what we've created is the vehicle that will get us where we need to go, but we haven't necessarily described exactly what the path will be. For you, who works out in the field doing all this type of work, um, I guess, what do you see as your biggest concern out there, with, and particularly with young people today? I think it's, it's the opportunity gap. It's the gap between how young people who are, um, who are born into families uh, with economic diversity at the lower end of uh, the economic pay scale, um, how different their outcomes are um, compared to their peers who are growing up in relatively um, well-supported and financially capable homes. Um, to me, I think that's happening across the country. Uh, and that opportunity gap is uh, very concerning for me. And this plan, I think, is a really great way to start genuinely paying attention to that in our communities. You said their outcomes as compared to others. What do you mean by that? I think their lifetime earnings, their educational attainments, um, uh, their general well-being, their health oh. outcomes. Um, it, it's really pretty staggering. Um, I had the opportunity to serve on the Health and Human Services Transformation Panel last year for King County. There was a map of health outcomes for King County, and it was color-coded. And it's probably the most powerful document that I have seen in recent years because the um, the difference in the health outcomes in our county um, are phenomenal. Well, and what are we talking about here? So we're talking about um, life expectancy. Um, we're talking about um, dealing with uh, or living with uh, significant disease or things that really um, influence your ability to um, to be happy and healthy in our communities. And when you look at the, the color coding on the map, there are pockets throughout King County, but it's um, particularly um, uh, strongly represented in South King County. Just by way of specificity, uh, somebody today living uh, where I was born in Auburn or uh, where I was raised in Renton will live on average, Enrique, on average 10 years fewer than somebody living in Bellevue, literally 15 miles away. That's the statistic today in King County. And um, a good portion of that is uh, uh, really driven by, uh, or, or, or is, uh, consistent with ethnicity and race and economic opportunity. Um, and we have at the county some of the tools, working with our partners, to change those outcomes, to bend the needle, to reduce the disparity by making early investments in healthcare, by not closing health clinics, but by expanding them, um, by making sure that kids have a safe environment to, to live and grow up in, by supporting their ability to be ready to learn at school. All of those things, we all know <laughs> what it takes to do it, and the plan um, really sets that foundation forward. Um, you know, we're 50 years after President Johnson declared a war on poverty. And we've made great progress, but still today in King County, 20% of our residents, 20% of our residents live below the federal poverty line. Mm. Um, there's 500,000 uh, kids and young people in, out of our two million here. That's a lot of kids. And the plan's goal is really to build structures and make investments so that a kid's uh, future is determined by his or her potential uh, not necessarily uh, just where or into what circumstances they were born. So really, this is at the heart of what this is all about. Mm -hmm. I mean, but the, the other factors of economics it really are playing a huge issue here. Um, and it's interesting because we, we are in a county that is doing so well, although if you look outside there, those pockets, that's a challenge. You know, it is, Enrique, but um, this gets a little personal uh, for me. Uh, I grew up in a house that was, frankly, economically insecure. Uh, I remember the foreclosure notice posted on the door. I remember the power being off. Um, but I was a kid, and we didn't have health insurance. But down the road at East Renton, there was a King County Public Health Clinic, and I was immunized there. 
and I was screened in school for dentistry and got care at the University of Washington Dental School. Uh, and I had great teachers and good schools and, and was able to go to Georgetown and then UW Law School and now be a participant in the community. Uh, so I know from personal experience that a little bit of investment, a little bit of care from the community uh, can make a difference in changing what might otherwise be um, a trajectory in life that isn't economically prosperous. And um, so I, I think we have an opportunity to replicate that uh, for lots of kids. And is a challenge for you and the kind of group that you work with and organizations that you work with out, out in the community is to, uh, I guess, to communicate that or is to you know, let people know that there are other ways of, uh, I guess, changing life? I think it's reminding people. I find that most people that I meet really do care about children. They care about all children, not just their own. It's reminding them that there are young people who need an investment and that they have the, the capacity to be a part of the solution for those young people. Um, sometimes we can create those webs in our own neighborhoods. The Neighborhood Watch is a good example. Um, I think what we're trying to create in a sense is a, is a county-wide watch where we're watching for all of the kids and the kids are down the street in Auburn, they're down the street in, um, in Covington, they're out in um, relatively um, unpopulated areas. We need to be there for all of those young people and I think this is what this plan uh, hopes to achieve. Uh, we've got a, just about a minute and a half left. Where, where does this all go now? So the plan is out there, we know what kind of the internal workings and how it all came about, but where does it go? So it's been delivered to the county executive and the county council. Um, we've introduced it for hearings at the county council. Our first one will be on May 20th, and then we'll do another one uh, in June. Hopefully the county council will adopt the plan uh, as presented. It will be um, really a very important policy document uh, that guides the county in terms of how we do business and also encourages us to continue working with non-county partners, right? Our nonprofit organizations, our school districts, our cities, uh, to in a coordinated way, uh, for working from a common set of uh, principles, serve young people's needs. So uh, it will be a living and breathing document, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it's designed to do that. But it has some key hallmarks. It has some 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 pillars um, that, if we stick to them, I think will lead to better outcomes for young people. And then there's the long term. You have to stay involved to make sure that this process continues as far as a task force member? I, I imagine that's, that's the task of everybody on that group. It is the task of everyone, and I think um, everyone is looking forward to the opportunity to reconvene in a year and see where we've come and what, what needs to happen next. All right, well, fascinating, and uh, you know, considering uh, the economic issues and issues of uh, you know, disparity in wage and all of that, very much a part of this, so yes. uh, best of luck with it. And, uh, Council Member Rod Dembowski and also Terry Potmeyer from Friends of Youth, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And thanks for joining us today. Please visit us at kingcounty.gov slash KCTV. I'm Enrique Cerna, and we'll see you next time.